Hi, Shannon Waller here and welcome to Inside Strategic Coach with Dan Sullivan and today, special guest, Pete Kofut. So Dan, why don't you kick us off? Because you are really excited to have Pete in on our conversation today and I know we're going to cover a wide range of topics. So why don't you start us off? Yeah, it was just about a year ago, I think, Pete, that you jumped up from the Signature Program to the 10 Times Program. And I I think you arrived early because I zeroed in right off the bat and we kind of clicked. You've been on a lot of our connector calls. You've been in the 10 Times Program. And each time I find something new about you to explore. One of the things that I found really interesting to talk about was, and I've had probably a couple dozen people who've had really extensive military experience, and then they jumped into the entrepreneurial world. And one way or another, they find strategic coach. And the structure of coach, I think, really appeals to them. And uh, I am a real history buff, so I'm always asking them questions about, you know, what their focus was when they were in the military. So I'd like to just start right back at the beginning, you know, where you were born, where you're from, and how you got into one big area of your life and now what you're doing in the entrepreneurial world, because it really involves probably one of the most transformative economic technologies right up there with double entry bookkeeping and everything, you know, the new blockchain technology. And you're very, very involved with that at a very high level with energy companies, among other clients that you have. So, Pete, beyond birth, childhood, (laughs) teenage years. (laughs) Thanks for the intro, Dan, and and thanks, Shannon. Yeah, so my dad's Danish and my mom's American. I grew up in Denmark. My dad is retired from the Danish Foreign Service. He was a diplomat with them. I met my mom in New York, and I was born in New York, but quickly moved back to Europe and lived there until the mid 80s. And so Danish is my first language. It's where I grew up. So I have an appreciation a little bit of Europe. My father's father was a partisan in World War II. And believe it or not, that sort of formed my interest in the military and certain aspects of it. Lived in Brazil for four years, uh, went to high school there. And then when I graduated, came to college in the US. And, you know, one of those weird things, walked into RTC one day with a friend and walked out and I'd signed up. Where was college? Sorry, yeah, Massachusetts. Went to Worcester Polytech Engineering School in Worcester and graduated with an electrical engineering degree, but was assigned active duty. The Army was? Yeah, assigned. Army. Yeah, with U.S. Army. Yeah. So was commissioned as a second lieutenant. And after, you know, the variety of training courses I did in the U.S., I was sent to Korea. There I served with a cavalry squadron up on the DMZ. And this is the early 90s. So it was still a pretty hot place. And when it was time to go back to the US to return to the United States for my subsequent assignment, I'm signing out with my commander and he asked me, so where are you going, Pete? And I said, well, on my way to special forces. And he sort of gave me this stern look on his face. And I said, is that a problem? And he said, hmm, actually for you, no. In fact, run, don't walk. You will do well. Good luck. (laughs) So I went special forces. And it's one of those communities where traditional regular army normally doesn't care for them. They tend to be a little less disciplined in certain areas. You know, they sort of take a somewhat relaxed attitude towards uniform and sort of towards, you know, some of the more common military courtesy. Saluting. Saluting. They, They sort of have a casual relationship with saluting and hats and things of that nature. But the thing I loved about it was the uncertainty really encourages creative thinking in dealing with problems for which there is no playbook. That is something that I found very attractive. And that is that, you know, you sort of walk in. It's not you do this, 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 and then it's successful when the outcome. And so I found myself there and I ended up spending basically my entire military career in special forces. And you were uh, mid 20s, late 20s. When right. You- yeah, I was. And then I actually left the service active duty. And then about a month before 9-11, I decided to go back into special forces with the reserve component, the National Guard, and ended up spending 10 years there as well. But it really was very formative about the way I think about problems, the way I think about teamwork. They sort of understand and embrace the coach concepts. They embrace unique ability. They embrace, you know, sort of skewing parochialism. There's just not enough time 
or resources for you to get caught up with sort of a bureaucracy. You have to think outside the box. You have to think innovatively all the time because you're dealing with different cultures. You're dealing with undefined problems. You're dealing with new requirements that are ill-defined. So very entrepreneurial in a way. And I loved it there. But then, you know, there comes a time every dog has his day and I did too. Then I decided I'm going to go back and become, you know, really a technology entrepreneur. My full-time job had been with a, a large company as a technologist. And I realized I just didn't like that. I get into arguments with people when they say, oh, you know, we only fund capital initiatives once a year. I'm like, well, what do you do with problems at the six month mark? They just look at you with a blank stare. I'm like, this is just not going to work for me. So I started the company and moved into critical infrastructure rail primarily. And that's what I've done ever since. And it's become, you know, more and more focused as, you know, as you get better at something, you do less and less of other things and more and more and better, better of a few things. And that's what we've done. Pete, you are in for one of our two hour connectors. And I've been mining the mother load in my close to 40 years of coaching. And that's the who, not how concept. And if you kind of take what you thought through you know, over the past year in the 10 times program at Coach, and you go back to your military days, especially the Special Forces, what's consistent about who you were back then and who you are today? One is I realized that my Colby totally lined up with what that was, right? So I'm a 3287. Yeah. So I'm a long quick start and I'm a long implementer. So pioneer, I think that was the, the old pioneer. Pioneer is, I think, what Kathy Colby calls it. And that's perfect, right? It's physical and it's risk. I mean, what is there not to love about that? Yeah. You know, skydiving and getting paid to do it. I mean, come on. And snooty about quality, very snooty. Very. About quality snooty about quality. I just don't like cheap stuff. You know, the only thing that's worth than something being cheap is if it's cheap, but not inexpensive. <laughs> you know, so I place a high premium on quality goods. So what's the crossover age? You're just finishing special forces and you're out into the marketplace. How old? Late thirties. Late thirties. So yeah. Late thirties. Yeah. So, I mean, my first time it was late twenties. But I really consider, believe it or not, my real formative experience in Special Forces when I went back into the National Guard, because that's when we had real issues, right? That's 9-11. That's going to Iraq. That's dealing with real, real adversaries to the United States. At that point, it's, you know, now you're hunting big game, literally and figuratively speaking. So that's really what formed the way I think about the problems. Yes. Well, it's interesting. You were in Korea up on the DMZ because I was in Tegu. That was the big KMAG base. So that was an advisory group to the Korean army. And you were in advisory to the Iraqi army and also the Afghan army too. I no, think. just the Iraqis. You know, it's very, very interesting. And a lot of people don't realize this, how much the U.S. military, when it goes overseas, really improves the infrastructure, the skill level, wherever they are. That was very true. I mean, Korea is today... The country it is because the U.S. basically created a new infrastructure for the Koreans after the Korean War. They came in and they hired Koreans. You know, they invested in skilled training. And a lot of people don't realize anywhere where the U.S. military is, people in the vicinity acquire high level skills. Absolutely. All the infrastructure skills, you know, whether it's construction, whether it's in the services, there's no doubt about it. And we saw that throughout you know iraq right there is a lot of local labor that comes in completely unskilled and they leave you know electricians they leave technologists it support logistics and they learn sort of you know how to run a business you know they learn how to run you know accounting systems and things of that nature so there's a lot that they came from that for sure yeah so as you got you know in the later years as you were approaching when you actually did leave the military what was forming as far as an entrepreneurial vision? I mean, you had been in the marketplace with a bigger company, but you were now going out there and, you know, you chose the East Coast or the Mid-Atlantic Coast. That's a really interesting area. The Piedmont Plateau is really, a lot of people don't know about it, but it's one of the greatest agricultural centers in the world. For sure. So, I mean, I was stationed at Fort Bragg originally, which is in here in North Carolina, about 60 miles south of Raleigh. 
when I left the service the first time in the mid 90s, Cisco was exploding. Cisco Systems, the networking company, they were exploding their growth here in the Raleigh area and IBM was here. So, so the triangle, the research triangle park, the triangle area was really, really growing technology wise. Red Hat, just a lot of companies. And I knew I wanted to be in the technology sector. So it just made sense to stay here. I find North Carolina to be a very agreeable state. I enjoy it very much. And the area here economically is a very diverse economy. So as you mentioned, a lot of agriculture, NC State is probably one of the premier agricultural institutions or institutions for higher learning with regards to agriculture. They have great engineering programs. So there's just a very, very heterogeneous economy, which means that if something goes sideways, there's an element of resilience there. Yeah, and a moderate climate too. Very it's, moderate. Yeah. And truth be told, a politically moderate climate too, yeah. right? So it's, you just don't see some of the, you know, the things that are more uncomfortable other places. People just, there's a little bit of a, you know, get along, go along kind of an attitude with people that have lived here a long time, people that have moved in. And so it's a very pleasant place. Yeah, and it's geographically diverse. You got coastline, you've got lowlands. You know, in the West, you have the Blue Ridge Mountains and so on. Yeah, so yeah, it's so a it's, pleasant place. Yeah. You know, it's very, very well located in terms of, you know, Washington, because there's a lot of, you know, enormous amount of, inf I mean, <laughs> if you talk about infrastructure or funding in the United States, that's the mother load of the infrastructure. So talk about, you know, the infrastructure with the rail, because you're the first person I think that I have encountered in coach who's working on the rail lines in the U.S. company, I guess, around the world. So what's interesting, right? So I'll start off with sort of a little weird anecdote, and that is that you often hear people in the United States complain about why we don't have passenger rail like they do in Europe. And I said, well, it's a simple function of demographics. It just doesn't make sense, right? You take a look at Amtrak. They're very, very profitable in the Northeast. Well, they're profitable in a way. And, you know, on the West Coast, you know, you need a population density and a predictable, you know, transit pattern for the numbers to make sense. It just doesn't make sense otherwise. Freight, on the other hand, is an absolute killer here. We do amazing stuff with freight. I've seen a number, and I've seen it several times, but I haven't looked at the numbers myself, that the per ton mile cost is 1% of the next cheapest solution when you move by freight. Mm -hmm. So if you think about that, right? So when you think about coal, whether you think about flat screen TVs, whether you think of, you know, dairy products that are going in refrigerated vehicles, whatever, rail is the way that you move stuff in bulk if you want to be successful. Mm -hmm. So as a result, you know, the United States is a beneficiary of the rail infrastructure decisions that were made over 100 years ago. They would never be made today. Between NIMBY and environmental issues, the benefits that we draw from the rail uh, infrastructure, we would never get if it were to be built today. Mm -hmm. It just would never happen. So we're very, very fortunate in that regard. So the freight rail, which is where the you know significant amount of my focus is, though I do stuff with passenger Amtrak primarily, it is definitely something that is a huge contributor to the economic lifeline. I mean, it really is arterial to our supply chain. There's no doubt about it. And I love it. And there's a lot of opportunity simply because of the scale. You'd move the needle a little bit. You're talking about a lot of money and capability that you improve. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I've been talking about to the coach clients probably for the last 10 years, and I said, you know, in a certain sense, all businesses in the world really are in the same issue. It's a complexity issue. I said, all of us are in the complexity business, but the U.S. is blessed with the greatest cross-country interstate highway system. I think it's the biggest, largest public works project in the history of the world, and it's about 63,000 miles right now. And every year they add, you know, if you take bypasses and connector things, they add another three or 400 miles every year, and it just goes on and on and on. The other thing is the greatest navigable waterway system in the world, if you consider the Great Lakes, the St. Lawrence system, and then the, the Mississippi River system. Actually, the Mississippi isn't the longest river in the United States. The Missouri is. And it's 87 rivers go into the Mississippi River, and they all go into the Gulf of Mexico. And they're all navigable, and they all go in the same direction. Plus, you have the phenomenal aircraft, you know, commercial aircraft, 
And that's going to be a huge explosion, I think, of the number of small to medium-sized communities, 50 to 80,000, who put in first-class airports because private jet air is going to shoot through the roof now that people can kind of live where they want to and work digitally. So there's a lot of complexity. You've got 50 different governments, and each one of them has its own way of looking at it. So do you find, Pete, with your consulting work with it and your engineering background, there's just huge complexity issues? Unbelievable. It is incredibly complex. I'll give you an example of a problem that if you could solve it, you would make the fortunes to be made. It is what's called wrong car, wrong way. At any given time, there's somewhere between 14 to 15% of the cars on the train are going in the wrong direction. (laughs) And here's the thing. Once that car is connected to the train, the only economic way to deal with it is to send it on to the next spot and deal with it there. Yeah. So if you could reduce just a little bit of that, the cost reductions would be enormous. The efficiency reductions would be enormous. So, I mean, that's just a little example of a complexity, right? For example, rail, people tend to think that it's one huge agreement between these railroads and they agree on everything. They're working on a sort of a federated system right now. And it's the first time that they've agreed on anything since they agreed on the gauge of the rail, which is how far the tracks are apart. Since then, they never agreed on anything. Mm Mm-hmm. It's very interesting. I have got a very, very brief railroad story to tell you, but I grew up in northern Ohio, so about eight miles from Lake Erie. And I grew up in a very interesting town. It was called Milan, same as Milan, Italy, but it's pronounced Milan. In the 1820s and 30s was a great canal building period for the United States, the Erie Canal, one of the great canals, went in and it connected the Hudson River with Lake Ontario. And then there was a connector canal between Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. And so this little town of Milan, it might have had 1,200 people, maybe 1,300 people. Today, it's got maybe 1,500 people. And in 1837, a very interesting person was born there. His name was Thomas Edison. So there's two worlds here that I'm going to talk about. You know, Edison I think probably the archetype for the technology entrepreneur, you know, in history. I mean, Steve Jobs could take cues from Thomas Edison, but he was born there. They, what they did is they created a canal from Lake Erie to this town. It had a river valley and they put in a canal. And in 18, I think it was 47, next to, I think, Odessa, in the Ukraine, this was the number two wheat port in the world, this little town. So all the wagon trains from Ohio, and Ohio was like the California, seven presidents came from Ohio. I mean, uh, Rockefeller is from Ohio, Edison's from Ohio, the Wright brothers are from Ohio. And it was this kind of industrial agricultural powerhouse. So around 1850, railroads were going in And the heads of railroads came to the town fathers of Milan, Ohio, and they said, you know, since you got the canal here and you got all these connections, why don't we put our railroads through there? And they said, you know, this is a pretty little town. And, uh, you know, your, your railroads look dirty. They look, you know, they're smoky and everything else. And we don't see any future for a railroad. We think canal is it. They said, okay, well, thanks. And... They moved four miles to the south to a town called Norwalk, Ohio. They had three rail, three rail lines went through. Even when I was, you know, in my teens, there were still three railroads that went through that town. And the canals were all gone within 10 years after their decision. And then, of course, Edison eventually ended up in New Jersey. And, you know, that's uh, the beginning of an entire new era of America. But railroads, I would say, are kind of invisible to people. People said, well, you remember when we used to have railroads? How big is the system if you just take the freight rails? How big is the system actually? Well, Dan, you've flown into Chicago. (laughs) It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. You will see yards where there's like 70, 80 tracks wide. I mean, Chicago, there's parts when you're, certainly if you're coming in from the southeast and you're coming in sort of over Gary, 
and coming in. Yep. I mean, you take a look out there. Chicago is where all of the major railroads come together, right? So BNSF, Union Pacific, CSX, and Norfolk Southern, and Kansas City Southern, they all come in and they all run by a central company. And Canadian Pacific. Yeah, of course, CP and CN come in there as well. Yeah, Canadian Pacific and Canadian National. And they all come in there as well. So there's seven railroad, big railroads that come in there. And they're all, well, there's a few more, but certainly the big ones. And they all are managed by a company called Belt Railway. And their job is basically just to keep that whole system from just completely exploding of a massive heart attack. And they do it really, really well. But it's amazing. The complexity is overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just think each of those railroads has 15% of their cars that are going the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, I know. And so, you know, people have spent, and then there are people who say, oh, we'll just put a GPS on it. They're like going, well, how are you going to power it? And they're like, then they realize only refrigerated cars have power. On yeah. Them. We often go to Arizona for our free days and we drive from Phoenix to Tucson and you see the big trains going to Mexico or coming from Mexico and they have easily three engines, three engines on them, sometimes four engines on them. And I just decided to count one day and it was 180 cars, 180 cars. And they were double container, you know, they were flatbeds with two containers on top, you know, just for comparison, how many 747s would that be? You know, I mean, if you were flying this stuff. I don't know. It'd probably be like 120 747 because- Oh, yeah, it's the hundreds. 100 yeah. containers, yeah. You know, once it gets rolling, there isn't much cost to it. No, hence 1%, you know, but that's also why railroads tend to have a significant amount of unique legislative leeway in terms of what their liabilities are. Because they're like, look, I can't stop a 150 car train just because somebody's car, you know, stopped on my track. I can't do that. Everything would come to a stop. So, you know, the liabilities and, and almost always if there's an accident or something like that, the liability is almost on the person that's encroaching on the territory. But for, you know, heavy freight use over long distances, the U.S. is very much an expert in this field, aren't they? Because it Clearly. literally Clearly. connects certainly the lower 48. And I guess, you know, they do the connectors up to Alaska. And, you know, and logistics is really an American specialty. Americans are just tremendous at logistics. And th that, of course, is a incredibly complex field. But I remember a story. This was after the Normandy invasion. I was born, actually, about two weeks before Normandy in 1944. Oh. I've had an intense interest in reading about what was going on in Europe at that time. But there's a story of this German general, and he's watching a U.S. supply train going by, and it's three miles long. It's three miles long. And he said, on that one train is more military equipment and supplies than I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> And he says, this is the fifth one today. <laughs> Here's a story that'll delight you. You know, this is off track, but this is what it is. The U.S. at the end of 44 was producing so much new equipment that the Pacific Fleet of Word went out in January that all the existing Hellcats and Corsairs that they had on board ship, new planes were being flown to them, so they just push the other ones over to the side. <laughs> so he says, we're using up too much manpower repairing these. We'll just send you new ones. They're better. So they just shoved all their planes over the side. A lot of very nice reefs at the bottom at 12,000 feet down, you know. That explains why we are the way we are. Yep. We're just, I'll just replace it. Don't fix it. Yeah. So you brought up an incredibly important topic, Pete, in one of the workshops. And I think Shannon will kind of, you know, ask you a lot of questions about this, but it's this new thing called blockchain. And my sense is that people have gotten kind of off on the wrong track with this because there's sort of an entertainment with this, with a thing called non-fungible tokens and everything. From your perspective, when you first learned about it and you actually wrapped your mind around it, difference making, blockchain. Tell us why this is one of the great world difference making from a technology standpoint. So if you go back and look at, um, so Time Magazine in July of 94, I think it was July 25th, ran one that's called, the cover said, the strange new world of the internet. 
And it was, you know, the challenges in cyberspace or something like that. I actually have that magazine framed because I got it. I was a subscriber at the time. And I realized at that time, this is going to change the way we do everything. And I didn't know how, and I don't think anybody really knew how, right? There was no Google yet. There was no Amazon yet. You know, Apple's computers were terrible. You know, they had gone from being good to bad and they hadn't come back to being good yet. You know, so there was, you know, the PCs were kind of clunky and, but we knew that there was this technology that was moving out of academia and out of the government space, and it was now going to become commercially available. And then shortly thereafter, browsers started enabling something called encryption, which is when you see your little lock, your HTTPS. And that was the real game changer, because now you could actually transact securely over the web. But it's all the stuff that's come afterwards that nobody knew what was going to happen and what was it. So you had this core platform called the web, the internet and the web. But you had all this possibility. It was this toolkit, and we didn't know where it would take us. Well, look where it has taken us in the last 25, 30 years. The journey has just been mind-blowing. And you talked about it in my favorite book that you've actually ever written, and I have it right here. It is actually my favorite Dan Sullivan book, The Great Crossover. Oh, wow. (laughs) Sorry, I know I'm not supposed to say that with not how. You're in a rare breed, Pete. That was 1994. 94, absolutely. Yeah. So, Pete, that's the very first book I worked on with Dan. I love the it. very like, first one. <laughs> you know, I'm not allowed to say because Dan is future looking, you're future looking, Shannon. It's my favorite Dan Sullivan book. It's a yeah. great crossover, and we're just about 50 it's years. Spectacular. It is so prescient. It's amazing. My thought was that the internet crossover, you know, we're switching from what I call a pyramidical corporate structure to network-based structures. And I said, you know, there's been other crossovers when we learned how to talk, when we learned how to write, when we learned how to print. And I said, this is probably the fourth crossover, and this is the new digital language. And I said, you know, it'll probably take about 50 years and for the change to be apparent to people. Well, it's been about 50 years since. And there's these things you talk about sort of, you know, it's sort of lined up with, you know, sort of this free agent, you know, nation book where people say, you're going to now, the days of one employer to the end where you get your gold watch, those days are gone. And it really sort of lined that up. The blockchain is that experience all over again. And I think maybe multiplied by a hundred. Yeah. That's what I'm. And the reason why is so the capability, so the technology exists. Everybody that looks at it for some time realizes that, oh my God, I am sitting on something enormous. I just don't know what it is yet. And the reason why is because all the different applications and integrations have not been developed yet, but they are coming, right? So there's sort of, just like with the internet, there were three different types of ways that entrepreneurs could participate. You could participate as a developer where you develop the core technologies that center around the, you know, the World Wide Web or the internet enabling technologies. Then there are those that extend it. You know, those would be the companies that built shopping carts and built communication platforms and stuff like that. And then there are those that employ it, right? So there was somebody that built Zoom and then there was somebody that employed Zoom like strategic coach that said, this is gonna be how we're gonna deliver our business. So you are an internet company as an employer of it. You extend it, you leverage the technology. You're not necessarily a core builder of the technology. And that's what I tell people. They said, what am I gonna do with the blockchain? I said, well, you're gonna do something with it. I can assure you. Either you're a core developer, which is a small group. You are somebody that extends the technology, which means that you have figured out a way in which this technology can be used inside of a certain type of line of business. And then there are those that it's going to be part of how they now do contract. It's how it's going to allow them to employ people around the world without cumbersome labor contracts. It's going to allow us to be able to extend intellectual property on a global scale without weird, you know, international consortiums having to negotiate different terms. It's just going to be self-executing agreements. Yeah. Extended ledger. So the term that's used to describe the underlying concept of the blockchain. The distributed ledger. Distributed ledger, I'm sorry, the distributed ledger. So kind of everybody knows what a ledger is. It's a record keeping, you know, you keep your 
statistics, your financials in a ledger. And that's sort of a paper ledger and people know what it looks like as an app. But the ledger is fairly, really important because the ledger is what provides the muscle for the blockchain. Right. And the fact that it's a distributed ledger is where all the power. And I should say here, I was immediately interested in it because of one word that was being used in relationship to the blockchain, and that's the word trust. Okay. F.A. Hayek, who's one of my favorite economists, wrote a book which was called The Fatal Conceit. He said, you know, one of the tragedies of capitalism is that it was named by its enemies. And people think it's about capital. He says capital is actually a byproduct that gets thrown off by capitalism. And he said what capitalism is, an ever-expanding system of increased trust among strangers. So there's three points to it. It's a system, and it's ever-expanding. And the fundamental thing that happens is that strangers who historically couldn't trust each other, you could trust family, you could trust friends, but you couldn't trust strangers, you can expand trust among strangers. And he said, that's the huge difference of our world compared to the world that just existed a couple hundred years ago, is the degree that you can trust strangers. Okay, so the Internet, you go back to the Internet and say, well, the Internet seemed like a great thing until the criminals found out about it. And then the criminals take advantage of people's trustworthiness to steal, to cheat, to all the other things that they're used to doing with anything else. The Internet's under attack right now, and something has to be created to restore trust to the use of the Internet. And I think blockchain is the method. Am I correct in this? It is clearly a prime candidate to solve a lot of the problems. The thing about the distributed ledger, so if you think of a traditional ledger and that you, you know, dual entry system where you have the ability to audit it, what the distributed ledger of the blockchain is, it's essentially that, but with built in auditing. And the audit is done by a decentralized group of people. So it essentially almost becomes like the panopticon where everybody's looking at the same numbers at the same time. So if anybody wants to, you know, try to surreptitiously break out the eraser and fudge the numbers, they can't do that because everybody else says, you know what, whatever change you made in the subsequent four audits, those changes weren't really authorized. So what happens is it allows for a zero trust system to be employed, which is ideal because now you don't have to have an organization that you depend on that now becomes a trusted entity. So, you know, the situation that where you ran into with Arthur Anderson, those kind of problems sort of go, you know, I'm not going to say they go away, but they can certainly be minimized because there's not this one person or this one entity that you have to trust. And that is an incredibly powerful thing because what that does is it places the power of ownership and proof of ownership on the individual owning it, yeah. right? So whereas like real estate, for example, where you have title on it, it's all nice and good. But at the end of the day, the register of deeds is the one that really says, well, you know, you don't really own this kind of a thing. And now you can get yourself caught up with all sorts of debates about whether you own something. And imagine once this moves into more abstract things like intellectual property, what this allows you to do is to now say, everybody here agreed that this was the contract and these were the terms. There's no need to have a long debate about it. Yeah. My interest was great because we're an intellectual capital company. I mean, except for our intellectual property that we create in terms of concepts and tools, we don't have any value to our company. I mean, we've got a cash flow goal, but what's attracting the check writers is the fact that we have intellectual property. And I think, you know, we've kind of done a good job. And I was talking to John Farrell and he said, I have to tell you, that compared with most people whose problems, you know, we try to solve that you've actually done a really good job because my belief is that property historically has been the basis of all individual freedom. If you have guarantee to your personal property, it's the freedom of property ownership that generates all other freedom in the world. So my sense is if you take the words intellectual and property, 
the letters for property are about 20 times bigger than the word intellectual. Right. <laughs> I tell people, you can think anything you want about intellectual, but the important word here is property. So talk to me in your interest and how you're applying it. And let's say three things that your knowledge of blockchain and your utilization of blockchain with regard to the focus on rails and the infrastructure of rails. So talk about this, because I think people learn by applications. They learn by sure. concrete example. Yeah. The first one that I'm very, very interested in and working with customers on is uh, supply chain assurance and knowing that you can actually prove all the component supply chains that they've passed through. And so, you know, everything, whether it's an agricultural product or whether it is a technology in any kind of manufacturing, now that there's an element of provenance that you can show, right? You know, proof of ownership and chain of custody. And that's really, really important. And we've certainly seen that in the last year and a half where there's been, you know, some significant disruptions to supply chain and there's been some impact to trust in supply chain. Yeah. Right. There's no doubt about that. I mean, there's some things that, you know, that the world has sort of allowed to happen, sort of saying, let's pretend this isn't happening. And, and now it's time to sort of face the music on that one and sort of shore that up. Okay, Let's put two things together, supply chains, the rail system and 10 years from now, three things. What are you seeing 10 years from now? And then how does blockchain support, you know, the trustworthiness of what's being supplied? So you will see things like everybody knows who touched what piece of material all the way through there'll be an app that says just like today where you say my product is here it's now here we've shipped it at this it's now at this facility it's not this facility it's now leaving it's on its way to your house imagine much much deeper insight all the way through the manufacturing piece you can say this happened this happened and there's this consortium of entities that are providing oversight and enabling technologies that say this happened Everybody agrees that it happened. Yes, boom, moved it into the next step. So you will have insight. And so with things like medicine, where that's gonna be an issue with you know certain food types, perhaps even you know materials that are very, very difficult to come by and expensive, it'll deal with things like forgeries. I'll tell you like the fashion companies in Italy and France are very, very interested in it. Louis Vuitton is very, very interesting because, you know, they're getting crushed on the fakes yeah. and some of these fakes are really, really good. And so now there'll be an, the ability to say, yeah, this is real. It's already being used in sort of silos. For example, the diamond industry, Absolutely. it's a very hot political issue. Again, the fakes are very, very good. And apparently, you know, that if you go to a reputable dealer who's very concerned about proving the provenance of a diamond, they can show you where it was mined, on what day it was mined, how it was mined, who the miners were, how it was developed, how it was cut, how it was processed. Right. Same thing with wine, same thing with paintings. You can put very, very tiny digital markers in these things and that traces the provenance of it. So everything will have a provenance basically, right? I believe so. And you know, if we're in the business of telling entrepreneurs of opportunities within their business, it's figuring out how they can basically get their business, which is in the physical world, and how do you onboard that into the blockchain? Is that, you know, via these, you know, nanomarkers? Is it via these whatever other technology that is going to come about that allows this physical component to be represented on the blockchain. That will be a huge market. And it takes the time out between one end of a transaction and the other end of it. It kind of makes it instantaneous, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Pete, the IP, I'll give you an example, and I want you to explain the concept of smart contract, what a smart contract is. Okay. So, you know, we've had this litigation and it's the first time in 32 years that we've actually had to take litigation, usually warning letters. And, and a lot of it is just people not understanding or not really understanding that when you create a new idea and you package it and it's useful to other people, that's property. Right. So I've been really big about this, but it's a very, very cumbersome long process for recommending to our clients how they go about doing this. And my real interest was that a lot of entrepreneurs are disinclined to innovate because they're afraid their ideas will be stolen. That's awful. 
would you say? Oh, there's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. And I think that's awful. I mean, that's the old, you know, hiding it under the bushel kind of a thing, right? Yeah. You know, the world deserves it. Build it and then figure out how to protect it, you know? I mean, figure it out as you go along, but don't walk away from value just because yeah. you're afraid somebody's going to steal it. Yeah. First of all, there's two ignorances colliding with each other. Here is they don't really understand the system of how you actually capture ideas, package ideas, and do it. So there's an ignorance there. They don't realize that the raw material of the problem solving that they do with their best clients is actually a very, very fertile trigger that creates new intellectual capital. They say, well, I was just solving his problems. I said, yeah, but you created a model that could be repeated a hundred times, but you haven't really packaged it to talk about it. And I said, that's one problem. But the big problem is probably you're going to use the internet to put your new ideas out there. And it's a great transmission medium, but it's also a great medium for having your ideas stolen. So what I wanted to do, I wanted to attack the problem backwards that if I can show them how they can, any idea they come up with and ideas they already have, that you can create a smart contract with this on some, you know, blockchain platform. And it seems to me that it's fast, it's easy, relatively speaking against legal costs, it's cheap. But not only that, it's global and it's permanent. Right. Yeah, for sure. And here's the thing that I literally just thought of this very second right now. So you've talked about the free zone frontier, right? So I'm not a part of that yet. But the free zone frontier. You qualify right in the middle of July. I just want to let you know that. <laughs> oh, OK. <Pete. laughs> so the free zone frontier, right? The way that, you know, and having heard about it is there's all this collaboration in which there's no fear of throwing it out there and strengthening somebody else. Because what you do is you create a growing mesh federal Federation of value that is strengthened, right? So mesh networking, the more participants in the mesh, the stronger the mesh is, right? And everybody gets stronger because of it. Blockchain essentially serves as that fiber within the mesh sort of underlying, sort of becomes that invisible fiber underneath. I think that's one of the things that people struggle with with the blockchain is because there's not something visible about it. It's like saying, I have this amazing new electrical system in my house. And they're like, well, where is it? Well, it's all on the walls. You know, and they're like, well, I wanted to get out of that. Okay. But no, it's this much better because of, you know, et cetera. And when you talk about all these different participants and that sort of ties into the intellectual property and that's the stuff that you have done, Dan, with, and I remember you were talking about it on one of your connection calls a couple of weeks ago. And that is that you focus on sort of what you're doing to grow the core value of strategic coach. There are all these cottage industries, and I hate to use that term because it sounds small, but there's all these adjacent industries that you are helping grow and they're in turn bringing people into the coach program. And it ends up essentially rising the entire, you know, all ships rise in the rising tide. The big thing is the hang up for most entrepreneurs, well, it's twofold and it's about the same issue. It's about that they are told from birth that you have to be a great competitor and you got to be sure where the money is. So we went along and we've got a very solid model that's 32 years and except for last year and one other year, we've been profitable every year. It's a very simple process because it's just open-ended questions about all areas of entrepreneur's life. We don't have the answers. They have the answers. We were using questions to open it up. So along the way, I got a sense of confidence that this is kind of an eternal model, you know, that uh, if you can just keep asking open-ended questions and they keep getting answers and doing something with the answers, you got yourself a forever business. And we have good reserves and, you know, we have a no receivables company, so all the money's up front, so we don't have to worry about receivables. We've got to the point where I don't have to think about money right away and I can just focus on capability, okay? And my whole point is, I can grow capability 10 times, 20 times, and nobody in the outside world knows I've gained this capability because it doesn't show up in taxable revenues. You're just doing capability. And therefore, I said that what I have to really get people involved in is that if you've got intellectual property and I've got intellectual property, we can put the two intellectual properties together. And my sense was that the explosive growth of the free zone 
will be people creating intellectual property here and here, putting them together to create a third kind of intellectual property. But we have to have protection for the property guaranteed before they'll do that. And not just protection, but also terms and conditions of how you want to deploy it. That's one of the things that's really interesting, certainly about like the NFTs. And that is that you create an NFT for a piece of art or intellectual property, you go to sell it, you can actually write into the contract that you will collect a royalty every time it's resold. So if there are tools that Strategic Coach develops, you could say, look, you're allowed to use this tool as a part of your overall development, but this little piece has to flow through. That's the provenance. This is how the cash flows back. This is the way it works. And you can now attach that all the way along. And if they choose to break it, you can say, look, you broke it. And look, here are the terms. You broke it. So because at the end of the day, people with guns, you know, they'll do whatever they need to do. But at the same time, it gives you a platform for enforcing Mm -hmm. and establishing clear terms of how you want to bring your value strategic coach to market. Yep. I'm going to get Shannon involved here because I know what her brain is doing with this. So I'd like to, uh, Shannon, things that have occurred to you as we're going along here. I wanted to get sort of the ABCs, the alphabet out here, and now we start putting together sentences. (laughs) Well, I definitely need the ABCs, so (laughs) I really appreciate that. One of the things that really impresses me about this, first of all, it's something that every entrepreneur needs to pay attention to. And most of them will not be involved in the development or the extension, but definitely in the employment of blockchain. So to stay, my question is kind of like to stay alert to that is I think a large part of what I'm taking out of this conversation. Do not ignore it. Do not let it go by the wayside. Pay close attention is one of the things. And I just have to say, I love the rigor of it, that it's less is up for debate, less is up for manipulation which expands freedom. And that's part of your unique ability statement and the efficiency of it. Oh my gosh, I love efficient. My Colby is not that different than yours. So when things can just move fast with as minimal amount of friction as possible, that is a huge accelerator. And you said, you know, it might be a hundred times or more in terms of even what the internet did. So my question is kind of from a practical standpoint, what do people need to stay alert to? How can they start to use this? I mean, I know it's kind of in the, it's not a baby stage, but it's still in the, it's in oh, for sure. It is baby stage for so sure. So what can people stay alert to? What do they pay attention to? What companies do they follow? All that stuff. Never lose focus on what your core business is because what you are very good at is something that you should continue to grow, right? So don't don't consider this to be the shiny object that you're going to abandon what you're good at. You know, that's like saying, you know, I don't like being on third base. I only hit home runs. And so you go, right? So you don't do that. And so instead, you know, focus on what you're good at. But in doing that, start looking for places in which there's agreement and contract, mm-hmm. right? So, I mean, Strategic Coach has lots of people in the financial services industry, obviously. So I predict you will start seeing insurance companies that will start moving their contracts to the blockchain. I'll give you an example. If I was in the business of helping stand up captive insurance, I would immediately be looking at how I can run captive insurance contracts on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. That would be an example of it. And I don't have to understand the technology. There are technologists that can support it. And in time, it's going to be, you know, as easy as using Google or whatever, right? It's going to be that simple. It's just going to be, you know, drag and drop the contract together type of a thing. You know, you have to know it. So that's an example. You know, if you're in the business of real estate, how do you deal with contracts and sign things like that? If you're in the business of complex financial instruments, you know, and so I guess the way I would do it is I would say, how do I get smart on this? Well, I would start maybe running it in a sort of a test environment, right? So you have the way that you've done it and then start playing with some things, developing your little skunk works project in a test environment and say, what does this look like? You don't have to do this forklift upgrade to blockchain. You're like, yeah, you know what? Yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. And before you know it, you're ready for production. Yeah, I would say that it's the use that's, you know, a first use, and it doesn't have to be an earth-shaking thing, that you just get the first use and say, what's that feel like? You know, what did you have before and what do you have now? Like, for example, we were looking at our files for concept development and DOS. We have 56 different versions of it over about a you know, 13 or 14 year period of DOS. It's even longer than it goes back probably the mid 90s. So, you know, we're sitting at 25 years and we've got, you know, tested, 
presented this date, presented this date and everything. It's a 25 year provenance of the development of an idea. And I said, let's put it all in one file. You know, you can't touch the file after you find it, but it's there. And you say, you want proof that this is our idea? Here's 25 years of it, you know. And just to see that, that this is all totally protected, what you just did, you know. We have 28 cabinets full of background development of all the ideas that we, we've done. Babs put a rule in from day one. Anything that Dan has written or drawn goes into a file. She said, this is going to be worth a lot, you know. So I don't know about that, but we have excellent records. Pete, we could go on for hours, so we'll make the hours in the future. Yep. I really love what you presented here. But I think that the simple thing is that anywhere there is a contract now and everywhere where there are middle steps you have to go through that can be improved with blockchain technology, would you say? Absolutely, especially anything in which there's maybe multiple triggers to an agreement. Now, anything that you can sort of bring in that, you know, becomes self-executing, you say, okay, temperature was above 78 degrees on August 15th, boom, that triggers this, that sort of, so basically you can write events almost like software code decision making. Yeah, yeah well, almost like thermometers for everything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, Pete, such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And Pete, it's been a real pleasure. I mean, I'm just so impressed with your background from international education and growing up, you know, all the way through the military and then becoming an entrepreneur and from railway to blockchain, not necessarily a leap that I would have made <laughs> or seen. Well, so I was in Argentina buying this spot and there was some other Americans there. And one of them has, have you heard, this was in 20, late 2010, early 2011. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of Bitcoin? I'm like, no. He says, oh, you need to read up on it. I went back, hook, line and sinker I was in. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> of course. I should say, Pete, with your Danish background, I've really, I've probably read 50 books on the Second World War. And I would say the only country that comes out looking good that was under Nazi occupation, the Danes are the only ones that really look good of the continental countries. They did fairly well, right? So they did an amazing job of protecting the Jews. Yeah, I mean, I think there are only 50 Jews, Danish Jews that perished. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty amazing when you think of the numbers, right? Well, when the Nazis came in, I mean, they took over Denmark I mean, really easily. You know, it's uh, such a small country. Yeah, it's a small country. And they put the Nuremberg Laws, essentially, for Denmark. The king of Denmark got his horse out. He put a Star David. Star David on his, and he rode right down the middle of Copenhagen. And he said, just let you know that you're not going to do this easily. My oldest son is named after that yeah. king. So. Yeah. But the resistance was really much more effective than any of the other. They understood very quickly that the only way that they would be able to do it was with an underground and an auxiliary. There was really no room for the guerrilla, you know, fight by day kind of. There's just no room in Denmark. They just yeah. they get wiped out. So it had to be the, like my grandfather, accountant by day, you know, partisan by night, which is what my grandfather did. Yeah. Yeah, and very dangerous, very dangerous. Oh, my God, yeah. Very dangerous activity, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. The, a lot of the righteous in Jerusalem at Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum, we went there, and a lot of them are Danes. They're ordinary Danes, and these were non-Jews who basically put their life at risk to protect Danes, and our guide was there, so... Israeli guides, travel guides have like a doctorate that it takes three or four years for you to get your guide license. And, you know, we went through the Holocaust Center and we talked to a 91 year old man who had been in Auschwitz for four years. But our guide said, you know, when you look at these people who are given, they grow a tree for every one of the righteous, like Schindler is one of the trees. Yeah. So to give you an idea who the people are. And he said, you can't make any judgment about this. And he said, no one knows how they will do when they're in this type of situation. And he said, so you can imagine all you want, how you would have been brave. He said, what we know is that nobody knows how you're going to perform. Yeah, yeah, there's no doubt about that. Cool. No doubt about that. No. You just don't know. And it has nothing to do with what you're made of. It just, you never know, right? There's just a combination of circumstances and experiences that lead us to 
decisions that are sometimes, and they're made with the amygdala, right? Yeah. So they're not even made with our frontal lobe. The, the big thing is that you did not profit in any way yeah. by protecting these right. people. There was no profit in it. There was no reward in it. You just did it. Anyway, it's a real pleasure. We could talk for hours, but those are in the future. Absolutely. Thank you, Pete. Pete, it was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Awesome. Awesome.